we began our discussion of valence bond theory, we confined our remarks to the formation of single sigma bonds. For example, here's the valence bond depiction of the bonding in methane. You might want to stop and admire it for a minute. But anyone who has practiced doing Lewis dot structures knows that covalent molecules can contain double and triple bonds as well. So this time we're going to see how valence bond theory treats these kinds of bonds between atoms and molecules. To start, let's just review a few of the fundamentals of valence bond theory. First, keep in mind that everything we talk about here refers only to covalent compounds. That is, compounds between nonmetals, which exist in the form of discrete molecules held together by covalent bonds, like methane. Second, remember that valence bond theory treats the bonding between each adjacent pair of atoms in the molecule separately. We look at each bond as if it were independent of all the other individual bonds in the molecule. For example, this carbon-hydrogen single bond in methane is considered to be exactly the same as the carbon-hydrogen bond in any molecule, no matter what else the carbon atom may also be bonded to. Third, each bond results from the overlap of the unpaired electron orbital on one atom with the unpaired electron orbital on its neighbor, like the hydrogen 1s orbital overlapping with the sp3 hybrid on the carbon atom in methane shown here. Now, just a word of advice. If everything I've said so far doesn't sound really familiar, before you go on, I strongly suggest you go back and review the ChemTutor module on valence bond theory. Otherwise, you run the risk of having a nervous breakdown sometime in the next few minutes. So, let's get started. We begin with a relatively simple molecule that contains a double bond, dioxygen, O2. And as always, we must first do the Lewis dot structure. In fact, why don't you hit pause and try it yourself on that piece of paper you always have in front of you when you're using ChemTutor. Okay, here it is. And notice the double bond. Now how does valence bond theory depict this double bond? Well, to answer this question, we need to take a look at the electron configuration of oxygen. Notice that each oxygen atom is short two electrons to complete its octet, and has one electron in each of two p orbitals. So clearly, to form the two bonds in the double bond, we should overlap one half-filled p orbital on oxygen atom A to a p orbital on oxygen atom B and then do it again with the other p orbitals. Let's give it a try. First, we can line up these p orbitals on the oxygen atoms and bring them together end to end to overlap, like this. That's easy enough. And in fact, when we do that, we end up with what kind of bond? That's right, it's a sigma bond. Why? Because the electron density in the bond is symmetrical around the bond axis. Okay, now let's form the second bond in the double bond. Here are the remaining unfilled p orbitals on the two oxygen atoms. Hmm, how can we bring them together to overlap to form another bond? Clearly they can't overlap end to end like the previous ones, so what do we do? Do we need to hybridize orbitals, for example? No, instead we can overlap them side to side like this. And when we do that, we end up with an electron distribution that looks like this, don't we? In fact, let's get rid of the sigma bond electrons and look at this second bond all by itself in three dimensions. The electron cloud looks like two sausages located above and below the bond axis, doesn't it? Indeed, notice that there is no electron density in the bond axis at all. So this can't be a sigma bond. Instead, it's called a pi bond. No, not that kind of pi. A Greek pi, like this. Why don't you try drawing a pi bond? It'll help you get the shape clearly in your mind. Pi bonds typically form from side-by-side -side overlap of p-type atomic orbitals, just as you saw here. Notice that to form the pi bond, 
we did not hybridize the atomic orbitals. In fact, this is pretty much always true. We sometimes use hybridization to form the sigma-type bonds in molecules, but not typically to form pi-type bonds. Pi-type bonds are formed by the overlap of unhybridized atomic orbitals on adjacent atoms. Always remember that. Oh, and here's another rule of thumb for you. Whenever you have a double bond in a molecule, it's almost always true that the first bond will be a sigma bond and the second will be a pi bond. You'd better remember that one too. Now I want to take a minute to clarify something that often serves as a source of confusion to students. Ow! Take a look at this three-dimensional model of the oxygen molecule as you sometimes see it constructed. Notice it has two sticks holding the oxygen atoms together. What do you think those sticks represent? Well, if you compare the model to the Lewis dot structure, I guess it would make sense that each stick corresponds to one of the two bonds in the double bond. That's clear. So where's the confusion? Well, some students get this mixed up with the shape of the electron cloud in the pi bond. Let's take another look at just the pi bond and the double bond. Notice how it almost looks like two bonds, not one. But don't be fooled by the fact that the electron cloud has two lobes. This is one electron cloud. Just as an atomic p orbital that looks like this, with two lobes, is one electron cloud. In the pi bond, there are two electrons in this cloud, just as there are up to two electrons in a p-type atomic orbital. So you see how a model like this one could result in some misconceptions? It doesn't represent the two lobes of the pi bond, it represents the two bonds, one a sigma bond and the other a pi bond, the latter of which consists of two lobes, one above and one below the plane of the bond axis. Now while we're on this subject, we need to recognize that there is a node in the pi bond, just as there is a node in the p orbitals, which overlapped to form the pi bond in the first place. Let's look again at how the pi bond is formed. The two p orbitals come together side by side, like this. Each p orbital has a planar node at the position of the nucleus, right? That node is a place where the electron density is zero. Or put another way, that node is a place where the standing electron wave has zero amplitude. So it stands to reason that the resulting pi bond will have a planar node that runs through the two atomic nuclei. And here's what that planar node looks like. Notice that this node is right smack dab in the bond axis. And that is one of the characteristics of a pi bond. It has a planar node in the bond axis. Wow, amazing! We've seen how a pi bond is one of the two bonds in a double bond. What happens when we have a triple bond, I wonder? Well, let's take a look at one of the best examples of triple bonding in nature, another component of the air we breathe, dinitrogen. Here's its Lewis dot structure. I'm sure you wouldn't have any trouble constructing this yourself. And here's the electron configuration of each nitrogen atom by itself. Notice that there are three unpaired electrons all ready to form the triple bond by pairing up with unpaired electrons on a neighbor. Just as for dioxygen, we can form one bond by overlapping end-to-end -end p orbitals like this. We can then form a second bond by side-by-side -side overlap of adjacent p orbitals like this. Look familiar? Nothing new so far. How shall we form the third bond? Well, notice that the remaining p orbital on each nitrogen is sticking out of the computer screen at you. They're also lined up side by side, and so they, like the previous two, can overlap side by side to form another pi bond, like the one we just formed a minute ago, like this. So what do we end up with then? We have a sigma bond in the bond axis, and two pi bonds at right angles to one another when looking down the bond axis. Let's take out the sigma bonding electron cloud 
and show just the two pi bonding electron clouds. You see the two are perfectly equivalent. And you can take it as a rule of thumb that in almost every case you'll run into in this introductory chemistry class, when you encounter a triple bond, that bond will consist of a sigma bond and two pi bonds arranged like that. And what about nodes? Well, as I'm sure you guessed, each pi bonding electron cloud has its own planar node. They're 90 degrees apart, and they look like this. Compounds that contain double bonds can exhibit a very interesting phenomenon that we call resonance. Let's use this molecule, called benzene, to illustrate the point. Benzene has the formula C6H6 and is composed of six carbon atoms bonded in a row which curve back on themselves to form a circle like this. In the Lewis dot structure, every other CC bond in the ring is a double bond. Now, Let's take a look at the valence bond model showing how the bonds in benzene are constructed. First, let's look at the valence electron configuration of carbon. Each carbon atom has a filled 2s subshell and two electrons in the p orbitals as shown here. Now if you look at the molecule, you notice that each carbon is bonded to three atoms, two neighboring carbons and one hydrogen. That means we need to form a sigma bond to each of these three atoms. And to do so, we need three unpaired electrons on the carbon. So, in typical fashion, we need to unpair the paired electrons in the 2s subshell by promoting one electron up to the p subshell. Next, we form a set of three hybrid orbitals, each containing one electron on the carbon ready to overlap with the orbitals on the adjacent atoms to form the sigma bonds. And the type of hybrid orbital which comes in sets of three is the sp2 type. So, we form sp2 hybrid orbitals. With me so far? Now take a look at the electrons on carbon. To form sp2 hybrids, we use only the s and two of the p electrons. That leaves the last p electron out of the mix and that p orbital remains unchanged. The sp2 orbitals have been used to make the sigma bonds. Let's look at these orbitals now as they appear in the molecule. Notice that because of the geometry of the sp2 orbitals, trigonal planar, all the sigma bonds lie in a plane, making the whole molecule flat like a ring. But the leftover p orbitals on the carbon atoms stick out above and below the plane of the ring. These can then overlap side by side to form pi bonds, and they do. So every other bond in the ring is a double bond, consisting of a sigma and a pi bond. And here's where this strange concept of resonance comes in. Couldn't we just as well have overlapped the p orbitals the other way, forming double bonds between the other pairs of carbon atoms like this? Yes. In fact, nature doesn't distinguish between these two possibilities, and we say that the two structures, you see, are in fact equivalent. You might think of the double bond as swapping back and forth between these two structures. This phenomenon is called resonance, because we might envision the benzene molecule as resonating back and forth between these two alternatives. And indeed, the characteristics of bonding in molecules like benzene bear out the hypothesis that something like resonance is happening. You'll undoubtedly run into the concept of resonance again as you study the structures of molecules, especially compounds containing carbon.